Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. I have the pleasure to introduce Ying Yi Wang. Ying Yi graduated from Fudan University in June 2023 with a master's degree in Chinese paintings conservation. Before receiving her master's degree, Ying Yi was trained as a younger generation of conservation talent at the Nanjing Museum. Currently, she is a Chinese painting conservation intern at the National Museum of Asian Art. Ying Yi graduated from one of the earliest masters of conservation programs in China and is excited to explore how museums work in the US. I welcome Ying Yi to the podium. Hi everyone, I'm Ying Yi. I've just graduated from Fudan's Paintings Conservation Program in China, and I'm still pursuing this field at a Mellon Fellowship Fellow of Chinese Paintings Conservation at the National Museum of Asian Art. Today, I'm going to be telling you about the reform of training system for conservators in China, how we transform from apprenticeships to graduate programs especially in paintings conservation. So I will begin by introducing the traditional approach of paintings conservation and the development of graduate conservation programs in China. Then I will give you an overview of food dance conservation program that I went to. After that, I will go on to discuss the reform of the training system for conservators in China from the perspective of the emerging generation, considering the influence of Western concepts. In China, the conservation of paintings is a rather complex field of study. To be a conservator, you should start from learning hand skills acquired with knowledge on traditional tools and materials. You have to learn mounting techniques for new paintings and old paintings. For years, you have to learn all the formats like album, hand scroll, hand scrolls. Then you can start learning treatment techniques. In addition, conservators also learn how to make reproductions of paintings. Conservators typically began as apprentices and the skills were traditionally passed down within the family. Here is an example to show how hand skills passed down within four generations of the Do's family. It's a famous mountain family in China. So Do Xiangyun and Do Zhirong both apprenticed for Liu Dingzhi. And he's a famous master in Shanghai in the 1920s to learn Chinese paintings conservation. Then they worked as conservators in Shanghai Museum and continued this legacy. Dou Zhirong passed on all his expertise to his granddaughter, Dou Xuhong, and Dou Zhirong's son-in-law, Liu Liugen, established Dou's family studio in the 1970s. In 2012, Dou Zhirong left his last word, don't lock the legacy in the coffin, and changed Dou Xuhong's mind. Then Dou Xuhong started unreservedly passing on the techniques to more students. One time she came to Fudan University to give a lecture, so I could have the opportunity to know about her family story. Lu Zongren, is Dou Zhirong's apprentice and worked in Shanghai Museum for 16 years before he went to Japan in 1989. Lu Zongren returned home in 2011 and started teaching graduate students in 2015. Another example for opening mind is Wei Wenfu, who learned from Dou Xiangyun and became an important private conservator in Shanghai. Wei Wenfu has clients from auction companies to private collectors. He firstly declined to be interviewed, but in recent years, he also started giving lectures in universities. In China, graduate conservation programs are very young. In the past, treatment was totally separate from science 
and education in treatment practice was mostly introduced in vocational schools, poor in artistic aesthetics, scientific content, and research methodology. In 2001, Central Academy of Art established a program, and the title was Chinese Paintings Identification and Restoration. This program firstly introduced paintings restoration to graduate level and ended in 2015. Then in 2015, Chinese National Academy of Arts established a Chinese paintings conservation program since Lu Zongren returned from Japan and decided to teach graduate students there. Then in 2016, Nanjing University of Arts started to enroll master degree candidates in their conservation programs with three specializations, ceramics, books, and paintings. In 2019, Fudan University established the paintings conservation program and I'm one of the first graduates of this program. In China, you have to fulfill certain requirements to get into master's programs. They have changed in recent years. I studied Chinese language and literature in college. And to get into Fudan's conservation program, I took the graduate entrance examination. All the master degree candidates in China have to take this examination. But the specific subjects in the examination are different due to the requirements of different universities and programs. For me, I took the tests of political theory, foreign language, mathematics, and writing. Then in the interview, I did a presentation of myself and I was tested on hand skills, conservation theory, and ancient Chinese prose. As you can see, I marked subjects you need to prepare for different programs in different colors. For example, to get into programs in Nanjing University of Arts, there are extra tests for non-art major students. Compared with the admission requirements for conservation programs in the US, there are no specific coursework and internship requirements for programs in China because it's hard to reach out conservators in your area and there are no lab tours. Students with no background of Chinese paintings conservation and mounting could not have opportunities to get internships in museums, which means you can hardly get first-hand information or experience of conservation if you are not from a family in this field. So we are still making efforts to improve this situation. Now that brings us into the Fudan Paintings Conservation Program. It's a three-year program with an educational balance between theory and practice. I'm going to talk about the courses and advisors in this program. In the first year and a half, the curriculum is designed to provide students with a broad background in treatment, art, cultural heritage, and conservation science. To improve my hand skills, I took the following courses. Paintings reproduction, mounting, book restoration, and documentation. I also learned some woodblock printing techniques. To acquire knowledge on Chinese culture and scientific research, I took courses of ancient book ident identification, ancient Chinese prose, art history, ancient book research and database establishment, basic conservation science, and Chinese bibliography. The reproduction course is worth taking in this program and is always the most popular course among students. Students from other departments can also attend this class to learn traditional Chinese painting techniques. We learned to paint on paper, silk, and we also tried to make fine paintings. In the second year, I learned how to dye the paintings. Sometimes we added ashes of cigarettes or dust in the corners of a room mm -hmm. to the dyes to make the reproduction paintings look more natural. 
Impending is a traditional approach to restore the image. It is a challenge for Chinese paintings conservator to paint the missing parts of the figures. So learning to do reproduction paintings also helped me to impend better. The left picture is the reproduction painting I made, and the right picture is the original work. In the second year, students choose their advisors and projects. We can have two advisors in this program. To pass on traditional approach, you can choose one master retired from Shanghai Museum to do paintings reproduction or conservation treatment project. Then you need to do another research related to your project in the perspective of provenance research, materials research, or Chinese bibliography research. You can choose an advisor in our department specializes in collection of Asian books, material science, or information resources to help you with your research. Today, we are witnessing a reform of training system for conservators in China. The traditional apprenticeship means apprentices learn skills in master's family-owned studios for three to five years or more. The government asked lots of masters to work in museums in 1949. Since then, young trainees were accepted into museums and learned from professional conservators on the job in order to learn the techniques. Now China is introducing more and more graduate programs to try to integrate traditional approach with conservation science and to educate highly qualified conservators for the arts, humanities, and cultural heritage sectors. So students learn conservation theory and practice in universities. With the retirement of conservation masters, we are facing the challenge of training the next generation. Training conservation talents in universities can be one of the solutions to remain respect for the tradition in conserving Chinese paintings. Universities engage masters from different schools, then different treatment techniques that used to be secrets within families now can be shared. Then uh, universities also allow students to study with an interdisciplinary approach to broad their background. Connected with local museums and institutions, students are able to be exposed to specialty object problems and treatments. Universities provide a good environment for academic research. Now with students can study traditional approach and materials with scientific methodology. For example, researchers in Fudan University successfully reproduced Kaihua paper. It's a kind of traditional Chinese paper and helped to conserve a lost technology with the help of villagers in Kaihua. Fudan also used this kind of paper to print offer letters for undergraduate students in 2023. And this is our offer letter. Students are having more opportunities to get into international education programs. I am now a fellow of Mellon Chinese Painting Conservation at National Museum of Asian Art. And I'm going to get further training and explore more museum work in the U.S. In Fudan University, we hold annual conservation conference and invite professionals from different institutions at home and abroad. I'm excited to take a role in passing on the traditional techniques from generation to generation. The responsibility can be heavy. I hope we can keep exchanging ideas and information and explore the potential for future collaborative development. Here are some web pages that you can refer to. There are web pages of programs in China and information about the masters I've mentioned in the pr presentation.
at last, I, I'd like to express my gratitude to my mentor at National Museum of Asian Art and the whole Department of Conservation and Scientific Research. Thank you for your attention. Please feel free to reach out to me. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Do you think the apprentice training will continue kind of always or like that that will always be a component of the way people are trained in Chinese speaking or yeah, just kind of that relationship moving forward? Yeah, the um, apprenticeship is still exists now, mm -hmm. but apprenticeship is um, you need to drop college, you need to start the apprenticeship from like 16 or 18 years old. So you can't have the opportunity to go to college if you choose to be apprentice. So now this is a problem. There's certainly have some issues. Biggest things on uh, certification in the United States mm -hmm. is that recognition of a level of training for the issue for Chinese conservators. Um, so, um, is there a state sponsored mm -hmm. recognition of conservation professions in China? Uh, yes, we, we now have this kind of recognition but in the past they are not specific recognition but now we have it are museums in china starting to require the graduate degree to get a job as a conservator in a museum yes yes now um, we hope more graduate students and phd students can can be conservators in museums now because in the past um, maybe some masters are maybe some masters didn't go to universities and now the museum hope we can have more conservators with higher education oh. okay, um, can you the courses you said you selected certain ones and were there a big choice of courses or were there specific ones you had to take? Um there are other choices. Um you can choose more courses about hand skills, maybe in book conservation, but I choose more courses focused on the paintings conservation. You showed us the the tree, the legacy of the one that one family. How many families across China have that sort of reach and legacy of conservation? Uh, there are so many families that have this kind of um, passing down the techniques in China, and um, the those family is one of the. Um, important family in southern part of China. And in the northern part, maybe um, Liu Dingzhi or other conservators. And um, almost every master will pass down their techniques to his son or his daughter like this. So like uh, how many students apply for the second each conservation program? Uh, okay, like Sudan, the paintings conservation program uh, in 2019, there are nine students and now maybe six students in 2023. Yeah, so um, the other program is uh, almost within 10 students, mostly six to eight students for every program every year. Scott Webster Nolly received a Bachelor of Arts in Art Conservation from Virginia Commonwealth University and a Master of Arts in Conservation from Buffalo State College in 1996. He has worked with the collections of museums and at historic sites all over the world, including works from the British Royal Collections, 
the Garapuri temples on the island of Elephanta off the coast of Mumbai, India, and closer to home, the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, Missouri, and the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. He held the post of Paintings and Objects Conservator for Colonial Williamsburg Foundation and currently serves as the head of conservation for the Smithsonian Institution's Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. Scott's research includes the aging characteristics of polymers, methods of the identification of historic dyes, and the use of laser technology in the cleaning of sensitive artworks. I'd like to welcome Scott. It's a great picture of Joan Mitchell, <clears throat> of which there are plenty if you care to research. It's a deep well. She was a love affair with the camera. In a 2018 article in the art magazine Apollo, a question is raised as to just how effective the public treatment of artwork really is. The mere suggestion of conservation work on public view elicits all kinds of reaction and response from conservators, from outright refusal to cautious implementation. While I tend to attribute this to our profession's inherent introversion and a somewhat natural desire to control one's work environment, it's a matter of record that the openness and engagement that public conservation can offer brings a flurry of interest, and often with it, much needed support for future projects and initiatives. When the Musée d'Orsay undertook the cleaning of Courbet's The Artist's Studio in 2014, the project raised more than 200,000 euros in public support just from interested visitors and online spectators. And closer to home, other institutions and similar initiatives, the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, and the Smithsonian's Lunder Conservation Center present large windows so the conservators in their work are always on display. Social media has offered even greater access to conservators' work. The British Museum makes regular broadcasts which, as a museum spokesperson relays, are very popular with our audiences and have a high level of interaction, showing the great interest and enjoyment the public receive from behind the scenes science and conservation. Welcome as such initiatives are, they inevitably can only offer a partial view. While this outward facing presence undoubtedly generates interest, the question persists, what is actually gained from watching conservators working? Conservation has become an increasingly painstaking and intricate process, one in which a conservator might sit for hours peering through a binocular microscope, making minute movements with a cotton swab or scalpel, or entering extensive documentation or observations into a computer. Arguably, this has limited appeal for a visitor. The surrounding equipment in the space has its appeal, large floor mounted microscopes, banks of lights, imaging equipment. But is this aspect of the work perceived as anything of substance beyond window display? What museum audiences may not realize is that most delicate and difficult aspects of treatment work may very well take place away from public view when conservators can work without distraction. Then there is didactic. And while more information can be provided through text and images, the casual viewer who lacks the patience to engage these will likely get little from the experience. However, when conservators actually engage the public, turning from their work to explain processes and answer questions, the process comes to life. It is then visitors might be encouraged to return to observe and revisit projects in progress. The success of these efforts then becomes incumbent on the practitioner. The frontline conservator needs considerable communication skills and must be willing to weave into their work the role of an educator. How much conservation work progresses during such public access is another question. Open access to treatment work can add considerable time and cost to a project. We've come a long way from the passionate controversy that erupted at the Sistine Chapel some 30 years ago, and yet such scandal is far from a thing of the past. 
By presenting such an uncomplicated view in some public programming, the very real risks of conservation treatments are downplayed. Couched in the seductive language of revelation and discovery, conservation can be all too easily cemented in the public imagination as not just harmless, but necessary, and thus its legitimacy accepted without question. The dramatic impact of a partially or newly clean picture has become an established means of garnering interest. And in today's culture of fiercely competitive applications for funding, conservation offers remarkable educational programming and an effective way of attracting both visitors and much needed resource. But if some attempts to appeal to the public can seem gimmicky, these efforts can often serve a profession that historically has been accused of working with a degree of secrecy, or at its worst, of costly treatment work resulting in overcleaning or inexpert damage to collections material. So what follows here is an example of just such an effort, with some notes and details that tailored its success. Rather than a planned project, the public work associated with the two Joan Mitchell paintings from the University of Virginia's Fralin Art Museum collections came about in service to necessity, scheduled display, publication deadlines, and expiring funds, for example. In 1999, the University of Virginia acquired two Joan Mitchell works as part of an exceptional gifted collection. Given by Buzz Miller in honor of his partner, Alan Grow, the collection includes works by Andy Warhol, Robert Indiana, Marisol Escobar, Joseph Cornell, Joan Mitchell, and Isama Noguchi. It is a remarkable bequest that resulted in an equally remarkable transformation of the museum's holdings. Unique to the collection is the story of Miller and Grow's relationship with the artists. Alan Grow was the longtime director of the famed Stable Gallery in New York City before becoming the director at the A.M. Sachs Gallery. Thus, many of the artists represented were friends of Miller and Grow. Miller and Grow were social creatures, notorious entertainers, and it was no surprise to discover that while the paintings in their collection were spared any marked degree of inexpert restoration, the surfaces of these works were, without exception, covered with an evenly deposed and significant accumulation of cigarette smoke and tobacco residues, not to mention a splash or two of red wine here and there. This is the uh, first painting, painting that we treated, Neige, in after treatment in the gallery. They're stunning works and really added to this collection. The second work, the much needed cleaning of Untitled by Joan Mitchell, prior to the planned inclusion of the work in the University of Virginia Fralin Museum's exhibition, Processing Abstraction, became uncertain given exhibition scheduling, deadlines, and the resources required to complete the treatment prior to the exhibition's opening. In collaboration with the museum's curatorial and collection staff and with support of the university's family of arts groups and organizations, the treatment was ultimately carried out in the exhibition's gallery on public view. For both works, Nej and Untitled, having gained a clear knowledge of the work's material composition, age, and history, it was determined treatment would only require cleaning of the surface, utilizing targeted aqueous cleaning techniques that would not involve hazardous materials such as solvents that might be required to remove discolored varnishes or failed retouching, or chemistry that presented health concerns or toxic conditions requiring fume extraction. This was a key aspect that made the cleaning of the painting on public view an exciting possibility, and the result was both dramatic and rewarding for both artworks. It's our very high-tech setup there. Within the university's mandate for broader cross-disciplinary study, the museum worked closely with the academic programs campus-wide to integrate the project into classroom programming. For example, students from chemistry programs were introduced to the family of organic compounds we know as chelating agents, whose role in the cleaning system served to complex or sequester metal ions. Engineering and architecture students were wide-eyed to learn that by controlling the pH of a cleaning system, a 
acidic or alkaline, we were able to tune or direct the chelator's attraction to specific ions and materials, essentially controlling one critical aspect of the cleaning mechanism at the molecular level. Over the course of six weeks, Untitled was treated on public view and in a dialogue with museum visitors, local school groups, arts groups, and potential donors. Maximizing the project, the Freeland staff managed an intensely focused calendar of educational and development opportunities with great efficacy, I might add. It was like a well-oiled machine. They had clocked these visits for the whole six weeks of the project. Amazing, amazing effort. In retrospect, the museum's location in the heart of the university and its established and active role in curriculum and cross-disciplinary studies and research made the project a great fit. Now, I would be remiss, of course, without a few words about Joan Mitchell. Joan was a second-generation abstract expressionist painter and printmaker with an essential and an essential member of the American abstract expressionist movement. Along with Lee Krasner, Grace Hardigan, and Helen Frankenthaler, she was one of her era's few female painters to gain critical and public acclaim. Her work can be found in major museums, public and private collections across America and Europe. Her work is energetic and kinetic in its mark making and juxtaposition of color. One gallery owner commented that Mitchell approached painting almost like a, a, com a competitive sport. Joan Mitchell lived long enough to see the end of what she termed the ascendancy of painting. Quote, there are no more painters, she insisted, only object makers, installation builders, and cartoonists, although she did continue her turbulent search throughout her career. As is the case with all complex projects, many hands made for light work, and here many were responsible for what was both a very successful project and an incredible teaching opportunity. Most conservation projects of this scope require a workspace with a war chest of available materials and resources at the ready, a controlled environment that provides for both the anticipated and the unanticipated. Once we determined that the unanticipateds were highly unlikely, the support and intellectual intrepidity that the Freyland's collections and curatorial staff brought to this effort was both inspiring and remarkable. Recognizing the educational and instructional potential of allowing both students and public access and the involvement in the treatment process, the Freyland Museum was quick to maximize the potential of this project. Thank you. As you can imagine, there's a lot unsaid in there. Yeah. When um when the treatment was ongoing and the the conservatory working in the public was able to do a serve, was there were there stanchions set up to like keep them a certain distance back, or were there didactics or how? How close were the, the members of the public to the conservator when the conservator was working in, in that space? The scheduling of the project proceeded like this. It was a series of like six to eight weeks. The conservator was working two days a week. There was wall label copy that was changed out after every week, noting the progress and what had been accomplished the week before. Um, the museum has an astounding relationship with both the university and its public. There's a lot of reverence there. It's not the same as we see here on the mall where visitor interaction is a component in dealing with collections care. Um, we didn't really ever need stanchions for the project. They have a very um, engaged and um, a family of guards really who uh, who watched the building like a hawk. And even with small groups of um, little school kids, what they, they call hot and cold running school children, um, we never had a problem with interaction. We did put up stanchions once during a cocktail party. 
And there was somebody standing there the whole time, of course, to monitor proximity to the work, but it never was a problem. And that's a, I realize that's a rare exotic bird in our industry. You know, the first thing we lead with is what happens if, and um, it's a unique environment for that. I, I would think that's one of the things that informed whether the project could happen or not. I mean, doing this, we would never do something like this at the Hirshhorn. I mean, that we, because it's a public museum, it's free, people come in and there is an entire range of visitorship, which, uh, can succumb to their their impulse to engage intimately, not so intimately. You know, um, I've seen sculptural works used as changing tables. You know, and you, it's 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 a whole different ball of wax. Sure. Anybody else? In answer to my question, I was going to ask you: Would could you see this happening at? Well, I think that when you when you embark on projects like this, particularly standalones, rather than something that is like the Lunder Center, which is an ongoing kind of didactic, you have to anticipate, think about what those anticipateds and unanticipateds are, and hedge your bets. Um, but as I said, again, security in the museum, it's relevance to the university and how it's embedded in the university culture. It's not really a public building, although it has an enormous amount of public access. It's just not the same environment. Yeah. Hey. Scott, uh, thank you very much. Um, do, you, do you have any lessons learned that you would share with other people that might be similar to the program? I think it's an incredibly valuable effort. I think it's worth cost and expenditure when the language of the work is relevant to the institution, the collection, its, its mandate, and any sort of programming that's ongoing. I mean, you have to sift through all of those different layers of whether it's a good idea or not a good idea. Uh, would it be in support of? Do you have a donor behind an exhibition in a private institution that would support an effort like this? The niece of Alan Groh, for example, was the principal author of Bank of America's conservation program. She's on the board of the museum. And she was in attendance for a couple of these projects. And there was there was a, a language in there about relevance and her enthusiasm behind the project. I just think there are a lot of, I think in short answer to your question is you have to extend yourself, your antenna, your ears to the possibility, but never sacrifice the collections material or the safety of uh, the environment just to get a show on the road. Does that make sense? Yeah. Another, another question, but it's another, another example I've seen how to present on the, the conservation projects in public is um, I was involved at the Philadelphia Museum of Art of rebuilding um, a really big bronze sculpture in place in the St. John Diana, which is probably uh, 25 feet high. And um, the way that was approached was um, the whole thing scaffolded and then um, shrouded off. The justification for that was because it was the for it and people in the scan. Sure, um, sure. But the way, and but I think it's sort of like well, also we didn't want to be on display so much. But um, we had a video camera that was in the um, scaffold, and so anyone was interested to watch live action in the water just outside of it. So you know, and they decided you know, basically so what we wanted, and then we watched on the screen and see what was going on in there. So that was like another approach as opposed to. So the public could interact with this one, but they seem very related. Well, this process was also archived. They had time-lapse cameras in the gallery the entire term of the project. And that video is being, I think it was some ridiculous number of hours, 500 hours. May May's here, she was involved in the project. Um, and that's being edited down to something that's digestible. And that will be archived and also available to the public. So there, the one thing the university does well is it takes a project like this and puts legs on it. 
and the technology is a huge part of it, being able to think outside of the box, for instance. Um, my first experience with a conservation on public view was the cleaning of Jean Antoine Houdon's Washington in the Capitol Rotunda. Um, they did not want to relocate the sculpture for treatment because of all kinds of different stability issues and putting the sculpture through the rigors of relocation. But uh, we did that on view. This is in 2000. And um, it took six months, but it brought such engagement from around the world. There were people who flew in from France to see the sculpture being cleaned because they were descendants of Houdon or uh, curatorial uh, professionals associated with his work and, and the Enlightenment movement. It was it's fascinating what happens when you put things out there, what they attract. It's like a big conservation fishing lure. Kelly McHugh is the head of conservation at the National Museum of the American Indian, NMAI. Prior to this, she served as the head of the collections care and stewardship department and as an objects conservator in the NMAI conservation department. She began working for the museum in 1996 at NMAI's research branch facility in New York. Kelly focuses her work on the development of collaborative conservation practices for the care of Native American and Indigenous collections. She continues to work towards shared stewardship through collections access, cultural protocol policy, and artistic revitalization. She was a core member in the development of the SAR guidelines for collaboration and serves on the Smithsonian Shared Stewardship and Ethical Returns Implementation Group. Thank you, Kelly. Hi, everybody. Um, I just would like to thank Pam and thank the organizers of the WCG's Three Ring Circus. It's a lot to put this together, so thank you all for your efforts. Um, I'm here to share a little bit about VOCA's uh, Native Voices program and how that intersects with the artist interview program at uh, the National Museum of the American Indian. So many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with VOCA, uh, Voices in Contemporary Art. Um, they work to advance a model uh, for the stewardship of contemporary art through conducting workshops uh, for artist interviews or time-based media. Uh, they produce a digital journal um, that really is cross-disciplinary and that it serves to connect the VOCA membership. And they um, provide public programming through VOCA Talks. And these you know, feature artists and their collaborators. And they cover topics of making, showing, and preserve, preserving contemporary art. So the idea for the Native Voices program um, through VOCA really did was the brainchild of Marie Watt. Uh, she is a textile artist and a member of the Seneca Nation whose tenure as vice president of the VOCA board um, just ended. So during her time with VOCA, uh, Marie really saw and witnessed a deficit in the representation and inclusion of contemporary Native artists in the larger art historical picture. Um, so she really did want to give voice and visibility to this community of artists who are making a huge impact artistically, historically, politically, and socially. So Native Voices um, is designed to be a cross-disciplinary initiative that will deepen the professional and public understanding of Native American visual artists working across media, tribal affiliation, and geography. The initiative will illuminate the art-making processes and materials along with highlighting the artist's personal and social histories. So it is funded in part by the Terra Foundation and the program will include a series of VOCA talks, artist interview workshops, and a dedicated issue of the VOCA journal. The first artist interview actually took place in September with um, the Seneca artist, Pete Jemison. He's an artist and also a pretty significant cultural bearer in his community. He was interviewed by Andrea Hanley, who is a, a Diné uh, curator. So, uh, 
there was a core group of us who came together to try to kind of conceive of the the program and to identify uh, artists that kind of fit the the um, desired um, kind of cross geography, Christ cross tribal affiliation, um, intergenerational. And so this is the group of um, artists that we did come up with that the program will feature first. There is the intention that this program will continue and that this is kind of the first iteration of it. So the um, interview with Pete is uh, available or will be available soon on the VOCA uh, website if you are interested in seeing it. So just to talk quickly, kind of one of the other intentions of this program was for VOCA to partner with organizations that both collect and care for contemporary Native art. And so um, the National Museum of the American Indian in its uh, establishment, the mission statement um, mandates that the museum work uh, to support a continuance of culture, which is really important and traditional values and transitions in contemporary life. So what this really means for the museum in tangible terms is that we um, have funding to actively collect and are actively collecting um, contemporary Native art. So at NMAI, though, maybe unlike the exhibition of contemporary Native art in a fine arts context, um, the support of the, the collection, which spans um, archaeological and historic, offers artists the ability to kind of stay connected to this um, long history and to really does create a fluidity between past, present, and future. And that creates a very dynamic and interesting aspect when engaging with contemporary Native artists. Um, this is a project we uh, also engage with communities regarding the care and stewardship of the collection. This is an Atna Athabaskan community and uh, members of this group were really interested in focusing and developing a program on increasing access to museum collections and really looking at the pinch points where collections are not necessarily easily accessed by, by artists and community members, um, nor is collections information. So um, there weren't really any designated outcomes to this program. The process was really the, the program um, to really kind of look and see how possible it is uh, for someone who isn't necessarily connected to a museum to uh, be able to not only access collections, but again, the, the, the collections information record. So going through the process was really interesting because two of the members of the group, um, Melissa Shaganoff and Demi uh, Macheras, Melissa is a fine artist and Demi, as you can tell, is a um, graphic artist who comes from the village of Chickaloon. So I think it's amazing that he has this comic book series called Chickaloonies. Um, and, uh, but they were really interested in using their skills and uh, role as fine artists to, essentially create a bridge between the museum and the community. And so how could they as artists conceive of ways to bring what is available in the museum and what they saw in the museum and in the collection um, to the community? So they created um, calendars are really big in, in Native communities. And so you see calendars hanging in tribal offices and in people's homes. And so one of, uh, one of the points of engagement that they they did was to create a calendar. And you can see some of Demi's illustrations um, along with the um, items they saw in the museum. And then kind of information kind of scattered throughout that, again, just to, to make it more, uh, more accessible. In cultural heritage conservation, I mean, we kind of straddle because the collection has this fluidity between um, all of the different categories or types of material culture, um, we straddle this interesting um, line between contemporary art and, and historic uh, and archaeological. Um, we in Western society really like to make those categories in indigenous ontologies. That is not really the way things work. And so we have learned a lot about trying to cross those barriers um, in order to kind of open to ourselves to different ways of seeing and caring. And so um, while VOCA has done a really great job, and I really admire the way they've brought together the contemporary art community, cultural heritage conservators who work with Native and Indigenous collections, um, we came together in a cross-disciplinary Native, non-Native um, group in order to create this set of guidelines for collaboration. And um, a set of guidelines was made for the community and 
for communities and for museums. Because one thing, um, unlike doing artist interviews, there is an imbalance of power. There is a lack of knowledge about how museums function and the different roles in museums. So the intention for the guidelines for communities was really to create equity so that in collaboration, we're coming to the table with the same, um, same information. So in doing these community engagements and then also being able to work with contemporary artists, um, we can do and do do just very conventional artist interviews. But one thing that really struck me with this exhibition that um, was called Before and After the Horizon, Anishinaabe Artists of the Great Lakes, it, it actually was in 2014. Um, it was an exhibit that featured over a hundred works that spanned contemporary historic and ancestral um, pieces, and it was really highlighting Anishinaabe life in the Great Lakes. So as the conservator on the project, one thing that really struck me is that selected for the exhibition were copper blades that were over 5,000 years old, in addition to Michael Belmore's piece, um, Shorelines, which he you know, hammered and annealed out of copper using the same exact techniques that the copper blades were manufactured with 5,000 years ago. So that continuity of the use of native copper throughout time was really fascinating to me. And I was interested in you know, not just interviewing Michael about, you know, his intention and our ability to care for his um, piece over time and the materials and the techniques, but just what he thought about copper and could we just kind of all come together and, and, and really just have kind of a um, brainstorming session about, about this. And so um, really struck by something Jim Eno from Zuni told me a long time ago is that museums are the have the possibilities and should be places where multiple knowledge systems converge. And so with, with this, I just called up Michael and, you know, out of the blue and was like, we'd really love to interview you about your work. We're really excited to have this in the collection. You know, we want to make sure we're responsibly caring for it over time. But would you also be willing to maybe do this workshop with you know, archaeologists and metalsmiths and conservators and collections people? Because we would love to really kind of dig into um, the use of this material and its importance to the Anishinaabe over this period of time. So he was game, which was really great. And I think the other part of engaging with contemporary artists is that because they are makers, having their eyes on the archaeological and historic parts of the collection and those ties to their belongings um, is really valuable for documentation and for, for the record. So Michael was really willing to kind of go through the process. We did some um, hammering and annealing with him and just had a greater appreciation of the work he produced and the challenge uh, to, to create something as um, incredible as he did. So that interview with him is, is available on YouTube. Another example is with the um, Cherokee art painter, Kay Walking Stick. She is a pillar in um, the contemporary native art world. Um, she, we had a retrospective of her work and similarly, Kay, you know, was really innovative in her um, techniques as a as an artist. She was using what is saponified wax to produce her paintings, but has been confused with encaustic over and misidentified in a lot of um, exhibits and and in materials. And so she was really kind to um, well, just to say that we have this Chief Joseph series that is made out of um, out of this technique uh, in our collection. So we had a lot of incentive to understand it a little bit better. Um, in order to care for it a little bit better. So similarly with Kay, you know, I interviewed her and, you know, it was wonderful. And she was really generous and gave us the recipe, uh, which was made from one of her friends who was a chemist who actually created cold creams. And that's where it, it came from. Um, and but I said, you know, would you be willing to like come and, and actually make this with us? And what we find is that, you know, through the art of making, different things are revealed. So the, the interview um, has a depth to it that if we were just sitting with her in front of her work or uh, we wouldn't necessarily get. The other part of this is that doing community engagement, it's really rooted in relationships and the intent is to have a long-term relationship with our community partners. The same is true with, um, with artists. So this really creates, um, you know, points of connection that you don't wouldn't normally have just sitting in a in an interview. We uh, the only maybe silver lining of the pandemic was um, our need to figure out how to 
create um, access opportunities for our constituency. So we, um, like many other places, created a virtual engagement setup. Um, and we have found actually that it's been most useful in engaging with artists. Um, so our collection spans the entire Western hemisphere. And so we have the ability now with this virtual engagement setup in order to um, really have some interesting conversations with artists. So this is an interview with Terry Greaves in preparation for um, her beaded uh, converse to go on loan to the National Gallery of Art for the exhibition that's up now, the John Quick to see Smith show. And then an art uh, interview with Peter Jones. Um, his pieces were going to the Syracuse uh, Gallery of Art, I guess. Um, and so that has been really, you know, it's just made it more possible for us to do this and to try to do this with new accessions and taking the opportunity when things are going on in exhibit and, and loan. I just want to say that, you know, this with this social reckoning in, in, in um, 2020 and with um, efforts, you know, uh, for inclusion, it's wonderful to see shows at the NGA and at the Whitney and at the Met. Um, I think that we have to acknowledge the advocacy of artists like Marie who are uh, critical voices in bringing na contemporary native art to the, to the foreground. We also have to acknowledge places like the Institute of American Indian Arts, which, you know, since the early sixties has been this really epicenter of training, really incredible artists with, um, uh, just a very dynamic and supportive environment. Um, the Museum of Contemporary Native Art in Santa Fe also just is uh, this really innovative um, epicenter um, with the commitment to um, sharing and, um, yeah, contemporary Native art. The SWAYA, which is the Southwestern Association for Indian Arts, has an Indian art market every August. This started out early on. It's just a very conventional, really focused on traditional Native art. Um, there was a lot of categories where artists would show. There would be a jury to um, you know, select winners. That's still really important. But SWAYA has really cracked open. Um, and there's just, it's a, a place where um, all kinds of media are on display. All kinds of artists are showing their work. And the most recent kind of um, dynamic display of contemporary artists through native fashion. Um, this is a very big field right now. This is a big area. Um, NMAI's director, Cynthia Chavez-Lamar, is very interested in native fashion. So these are two recent acquisitions to our collection. Um, we also just recently collected this incredible ensemble from the artist Ursula Hudson. This is We Are the Ocean. And uh, this is actually on display right now at the Renwick. Um, this was on loan to the Renwick by Ursula when NMAI decided to acquire it. So in the process of um, it going on, on exhibit, we did acquire it. And so our textile conservator, um, Susan Heald worked really closely with Ursula because one thing that was really important to Ursula is that the ensemble be danced prior to it going on um, exhibition. So this is the dancer at the opening of the exhibition. Um, so Susan worked with Ursula just in terms of like safely transitioning from the dancer to the mannequin um, during the course of the, the show. But we thought it was important because this idea of activation, this is part of this ensemble's care and stewardship moving forward. So um, we wanted to bring Ursula to NMAI to talk with um, Susan Heald uh, and our mount maker, Shelly Euler, um, to really talk about how this is documented, how this happens, what's important about this, how often does it need to be done. And Ursula's really, interested in having this um, ensemble be danced as much as possible. But then she said, within reason, as long as you can keep it clean, as long, you know, so she, um, it's achieving that balance, right? And so um, we were able to interview her, our great colleagues at uh, the Renwick were really kind to let us come in and interview um, Susan and Shelly and Emma interviewed Ursula in front of the, the mannequin. And then um, Ursula and her sister Lily, uh, who is another amazing clinket weaver, came to look at the historic clinket uh, collection and um, in, items in the collection. And that was 
a really um, powerful experience for them because Ursula's actually not, a, her mother was a very important and famous weaver who sadly passed early, um, too early. Uh, Lily is also a weaver, but Ursula was like a graphic artist. So the We Are the Ocean is one of Ursula's first woven art pieces. And it literally would make you fall down. It's it's just stunning. And so um, it was really important, I think, for Ursula to look at the historic textiles. And it was really interesting to hear the conversation between the two of them. So all of that uh, to say is documented in, in the record and will continue you know, to change. I think we will continue to stay in touch with Ursula. She, um, you know, I think she may feel differently in the future, or she may feel more strongly in the future about the, the the use and function of the garment, but that ties to the use and function of the historic pieces as well. So I just want to thank you all um, and thank our collaborators and my colleagues at NMAI. Um, I think that, you know, we feel fortunate there in order to be able to um, kind of explore these different relationships and these different opportunities of working with um, with contemporary artists and their role even in the care and preservation of the other other parts of the collection. So thank you. And please check out the VOCA Native Voices series and the website for the upcoming um, artist interviews and workshops and um, yeah, and the journal. So thanks. Yeah. Do you have a basic um no, it's a great question. We do have kind of a basic, a basic outline and it, and it, um, there are some basic questions and kind of stemming from, uh, you know, even the, the, the training that VOCA will give a kind of standard artist interview questionnaire, we will start there and then just tailor it to the specific artist as it, it relates to the, to the, you know, nature of their work. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's an excellent question. We have, we do. We didn't always actually, and then, and then evolved to doing that. And that seemed to, people appreciated that more and were able to be a little bit more thoughtful about it. We might throw in things that weren't necessarily given to them or just build off of what they're um, sharing with us. So, yeah. Thanks. Wonderful talks. Thank you so much to our speakers. We appreciate it. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. <laughs> Have a good night. <laughs>